the screen. So if you've got any questions and queries, please pop them into chat and Taryn will deal with those as we go through. Throughout the session, we will also be running a number of polls and we would ask you to fill out the appropriate response and then send it back to us and I will then inform you as to what answers we got so that everyone knows. And so with the sooner we can deal with the poll when it comes up, the quicker we've got an answer and a summary, and then we can move on. What we are going to learn tonight and cover is understanding your local fire risks in the Warrandai area, what to expect from a fire in the area, how do we know if there is a fire, planning and decision making, and surviving if the plan fails or we get caught out. So we've got our first uh, poll up. So this is about how long have you lived in the area and how would you rate your knowledge around fire in the Warrandyte area? So if you could complete those, uh, please, and we will get some results. Okay, we've got 26 responses of our 43 attendees have uh, voted. We're now up to 30. So if there's anyone else who'd like to reply, as we're closing the polling out very, very shortly. All right, so we've got a bit of a mixed result here. We've got 57% uh, of the people ha have lived in the area between uh, under one year to five years. And the 39% of you have lived in the, the area for greater than 10 years. And around our fire knowledge, low is 30%, medium is 52% and high is 9%. So uh, based on that, I think there's plenty for us all to learn tonight and hopefully it will help you make your informed decisions and plan around not only this coming summer, but future summers as the weather changes, as your personal circumstances and demographics of your families change. So we do know that Victoria is one of the most bushfire prone parts of the world, and that is due to our weather patterns, the type of vegetation we have, and the geographical features we experience. And Warrandyte is a classified as a high bushfire risk area. And that's based on, again, your, your weather patterns, the location, the vegetation, and the, and the physical location of Warrandyte. We break the state down into nine total fire main districts. And this is really important information about where we live and where we may be traveling or holidaying. For those of you who will be fortunate enough to have a break uh, very shortly and be able to get away after so many months uh, being confined to home barracks. In Warrandyte, we are located in Central District. It's a very, very diverse geographical area in terms of fuel types, geographical types and weather patterns and we can see from the map here we run from Lawn up to Ballarat uh, or we run across below the Central Highlands round through Hillsville and down to uh, Pakenham in the east so so Central is the one that we are interested in on what the daily fire danger rating is and what the weather is doing here in uh, Warrandyte, we also need to keep a bit of an eye on that North Central Total Fire Band District. 
because King Lake falls into that area in that King Lake range, and that's not all that far from us. So a fire going up there under a fairly strong nor northwesterly wind has the potential to spot then into the lower terrain and then move through the fuel corridors and it could end up in, into that park along the Yarra River. And the Yarra River, as you well know, runs through the centre of Warrandyte and is surrounded by continuous fuel. Our weather patterns are very interesting at the moment, to say least. Now, so we've got a, there's a couple of diagrams up here. One is the chance of exceeding the meeting temperatures for December 20 to February 21. Now, we've been very, very changeable, as you know. So we've had a few warm days and we've had a few wet days and the wind over the last few days is a bit of a problem because it's, it is adding to the fuel load. The amount of twigs and sticks and leaves that the wind has brought down and blown around our properties is quite high. So we need to start to manage that. Some of you may have lost trees, some of you may have lost branches. So again, all those things need to be cleaned up and gotten rid of. But the Weather Bureau is predicting in this part of the world that we may have a wetter than normal summer. Now, the good news in that is that will lessen the bushfire risk and it will push it off for another day because those wetter conditions and the humid days just make everything grow. And we may be growing vegetation that we're deferring off to another year. So our planning, our preparation work, it isn't just a, for this year, it is for every year that we are living in Warrandyte and surrounds. Now, taking note of the local vegetation. Now, Warrandyte is a bit like Eltham, is that we're in a rain shadow and we've got soil structure of clay, gravels, shale, not much top soil that fails to hold any great moisture. So it dries out quite readily. We have mixed species with our eucalypts. So we have a lot of ribbon barks particularly down in the wetter areas along the river. So those trees that have got those big long shards of bark hanging off them. And then in some of the drier aspects, we will have the stringy barks and the messmates, the fiber barks with a dry understory. And one of the challenges you've got in Warrandyte is there are a lot of parks and reserves in and around the township that are quite heavily vegetated. So if one of those parks caught fire on the wrong day, then that fire will escalate and there is no leading time. So it could well be that the fire starts in the middle of town and it impacts on someone immediately. When we look at our local risks, Warrandyte is a beautiful little spot. There's another pole up, so if you could uh, have a look at those. So. This is your view of what some of the risks in the local area are. So tick whatever the correct, what you think the correct answers are. Now, Warrandyte is, is a lovely little township. We've gone and put more and more and more people into it over the, probably the last 25 years or thereabouts. But we've still got the same 19th century road network. And you're pretty well picking it up here in that uh, we've got narrow roads. We've got a lot of dead end streets. We do have limited access and egress within the township and to in and out of the township. So when we've got those narrow roads, we've got a fairly low speed limit on Yarra Street and it doesn't take much on the best of days for the traffic to go pear shaped and to bank up. So depending on where the fire is, what the weather is doing, as to what our fire will do. Now our poll summary, so 95% of you have gone bushland, 76% with hills, long grass at 68% and certainly the grass has grown this year. And I was up the back of Eltham a week or so back and some of the grass there is up to the height of the fences, which is about a metre and a half. And it is starting to dry out. Narrow roads, 90% of you have gone with that. 
then in streets, 76%, and limited access and egress at 85%. And when you think about the roads in and out of Warrandyte, most of them are fairly narrow, they're lined with trees, they're fairly windy, and they may well take you to somewhere that's not much safer than where you are already. So planning is absolutely vital when we have these challenges in and around our access and our egress. Now, uh, Warrandyte, uh, the river running through it with the Warrandyte, Warrandyte State Park, heavily vegetated, it has caught fire before, and it will take fire through the township, throwing sparks and embers in and around the township and setting other buildings on fire. The road network, as we said, and for those of you who were in Warrandyte in 2014, on a day of extreme fire danger rating, we had an electrical asset fail in the area of Amersham Drive, and the first house was on fire within five minutes of that asset failing. So to sit there and wait for something to happen or someone to send you a message, it is too little, too late. We need to be proactive in managing our fire risk based on the fire danger rating. And I'll come back to the fire danger rating shortly. Now it's time to introduce uh, Jackie Quain from Parks Victoria, who will talk a little bit about the pound bend and some of the challenges that the National Park gives it. So welcome to you, Jackie. Thanks very much, Evan. Uh, much appreciated. Good evening, everyone. Um, so what I'm here to talk to you about is a very specific issue we've noticed um, over the past couple of years with Pound Bend. Um, but to start with, I'm a Community Engagement Officer for Fire and Emergency for the Melbourne region of Parks Victoria, and I'm here tonight representing our Fire and Emergency Ranger in charge, Chris Vassos, who covers the Warrandyte area and Warrandyte State Park. So what uh, I am here to talk to you about, many of you will have noticed over the past uh, couple of years, increase in visitation and traffic at Pound Bend as a site, um, and a lot of a lot more traffic, a lot more parking uh, issues coming up along Everard Drive and uh, Pound Road. So Evan talked before about that access and egress issue and your narrow roads. Um, that becomes an issue too with um, with those really uh, heavy. Uh, visitor days where people are parking not just on either side of the road but actually parking dangerously and illegally. Uh, and over time we've, um, that's presented some problems for um, emergency vehicle access. So we've tried uh, with VicPol, with council to try and do compliance activities to try and manage this risk to um, change people's behaviour a bit but it hasn't had a lasting effect. So along with um, the Municipal Fire Management Planning Committee which is um, a subgroup working group of that was formed, which also included um, Nillimbic Shire as the adjoining Shire uh, and Vic Pol, CFA uh, and our uh, colleagues Fire Rescue Victoria. Uh, we all sort of came together and discussed options for um, how do we address this issue. So one of the solutions that came up was um, the closure of Pound Bend uh, on severe, extreme and code red days. So previously, the closure trigger for Pound Bend Reserve has been uh, Code Red, which was the whole of Warrandyte State Park would close on those days. Um, but obviously, we want to make sure that when those fire danger ratings start to get uh, climb a bit higher, that we're maximising the ability for our emergency response vehicles to be able to respond. So uh, that does bring, with the closure on severe and extreme, as well as Code Red, that brings Pound Bend in line with other sites around Warrandyte State Park, like um, Laughing Waters and Norman's Reserve. And our colleagues at CFA kindly did the math for us, and that equates to about uh, five days on average a year. So over the past 10 years, there's been five days average a year that's severe, extreme, or uh, code red. So we, we know um, that obviously people like to go there and, and have a swim on the river on a hot day, but for the sake of five days a year, we think the increase in safety that that gives um, is, a, is a pretty good trade-off. Um, we recognise it will take some time for people to 
get the message around the change, uh, especially since we know a lot of the visitors are coming from out of town, they're not necessarily local, um, and they won't know immediately that, um, that this change is happening. So it's um, one of a couple of changes. There's um, councillors also looking at um, changing parking restrictions along the road in the lead up to the park, uh, to the site. So, so what that means is basically severe days, the gate at the top will shut, but it's not just about shutting the gate so then all the cars just park and people wander in. The site itself is closed. So we're trying to remove the incentive for people to come and visit on those high fire danger days. Um, to to create more of an issue for, for emergency response, but also if there was a fire for um, the locals to be able to enact their plans as well. So I'm um, keen to hear any feedback questions um, you have. You've got the chat there. I will um, take all those away. As I said, I'm, I'm here on behalf of the, the local team and, and the ranger in charge, and I'll get some uh, responses and feedback for you and send that back out through. Uh, thanks very much, Evan. I'll hand back to you. Uh, thanks very much, Jackie. You're very informative. And that map really sums up Warrandyte very, very well with those narrow streets and the fuel, the continuous lines of fuel travelling through Warrandyte that will carry fire into and through the town and out of the town to other locales. And, and also, given that Warrandyte is in uh, something of a a bowl or a lower area, an amphitheatre, it makes it a little bit more high risk in terms of fire behaviour. So that's a fantastic map. Right, so we had a look at some of the, the census data from 2016 and under the Warrandyte postcode, we had a population of about 5,500 people and around 1,917 properties and dwellings. Warrandyte Fire Brigade has two trucks and a slip-on. A slip-on is a ute with a small tank on the back and a pump. So it's able to get into some of those narrow driveways and some of the more difficult locations as a first attack vehicle. But when you divide the number of properties in the area, and two fire trucks in Warrandyte. In terms of a major fire involving the natural environment, then there will not be a fire truck at every house, nor will there be a fire truck in every street. If we go back to the 2014 Amazon Drive fire, somewhere later in that afternoon, we had 90 fire trucks in Warrandyte. So they've come from far and wide, and those trucks uh, entering the township on the very, very same roads that you are trying to leave at the last minute. And I'd suggest to uh, all of you that no one wants to come head on with somewhere between 15 to 18 tonne of sheet metal coming down some of these narrow winding roads under emergency conditions. Because uh, there'll be a standoff. And what we will be doing is directing you to pull into a driveway so that we can get the fire truck through because our priority is to get to that fire to try and contain and suppress that fire as soon as we can. And the difficulty with that is the worse the weather in terms of heat, low humidity and wind, then the more difficult the fire will be to contain and control. So our expectations from fire. So we'll, we'll have ember attack. So this is burning materials generated by the fire, taken up in a convection current and carried by the wind ahead of the main, main fire front, starting new fires. And embers consist of burning leaves, sticks, bark, twigs, and lightish type branches. So the more wind we have, the more fire we will have, the more embers we will have, depending on the type of vegetation we've got burning, as to how far ahead of the main fire front these embers will land. So the fiber barks give us short-term spotting, could be up to two or three kilometers ahead of the main fire front. But if we've got fire burning in those ribbon bark type trees, the box species, the uh, some of the ash 
where you've got those great big shards, then that can give a spotting under extreme conditions up to 25, 30 kilometers ahead of the, mine, the main fire front. So it may well be that the fire is not in Warrandyte, but it could spot into Warrandyte and start fires. So what we'll do is now run you a little video clip to demonstrate and explain a little bit more clearly Ember Attack. During a bushfire, embers will reach your home long before the flames do. Ember attacks are the most common way that houses catch fire. Embers are burning leaves, twigs and pieces of bark. They help the bushfire spread by starting spot fires ahead of the main fire front. Short distance ember attacks happen when leaves and small pieces of bark are blown from burning trees. The intense shower of sparks that forms fills the air with hot, burning embers, which will land on nearby vegetation and properties. The hot embers can easily land and get into your clothes and burn your skin, eyes and airways. Small fires will start all around you and quickly become uncontrollable. The resulting chaos creates confusion as the fire seems to come from many directions meaning it will be difficult to make good decisions about your safety. The experience will be physically exhausting and emotionally traumatic. Long distance ember attack is caused by large bushfires that generate intense heat. As the hot air rises, it forms a column of smoke that sucks in air like a vacuum, increasing the intensity of the fire. The updraft in the column lifts embers, like large pieces of burning ribbon bark, hundreds of metres into the air, where strong winds can carry them many kilometres beyond the fire front. On Black Saturday, embers travelled more than 30 kilometres ahead of the main fire. When these embers land, they often start fires where leaves naturally accumulate like in gutters, doorways and garden beds. So while you might think you're safe when a bushfire is far away, embers can fall from the sky and land around your home long before you even know there's a fire. But remember, your home isn't the only thing under threat during an ember attack. By the time you realize the danger, it might be too late as escape routes become jammed Embers can also start fires on roads and block them completely, making late evacuation dangerous or impossible. That's why leaving early, before a fire starts, is always your safest option. All right, that summed it up pretty well in terms of what we could reasonably expect of ember attack to happen. So the fire could be some distance, but the wind is going to carry it. And ember attack is the biggest cause of loss of buildings that we have. Now, tonight is not about uh, covering how to prepare your property or any of those sorts of activities. This is about your planning and preparation and making informed decisions about what you are going to do on those high risk days, how you're going to do it, and what your other considerations are, depending on your personal circumstances. So for fire behaviour or uh, property preparation, then I'd recommend that you join a local community fire guard group or perhaps attend a future bushfire planning workshop that Karen will undoubtedly schedule. And we will go into a lot more about prep, uh, property preparation then. But embers will land on our lawns, in our gardens, on our roofs, under our buildings, on our decks, and set fire to it. So depending on how you've got landscaped your property, what you've got around the place as to how bad that ember attack may well be. And there's some examples here that you can see, but certainly once the embers start to land, they are burning brands, they will start new fires, 
stuff will start out small. Those fires will grow and join up. And then with the way the, the wind currents work and the fire behavior works, then those spot fires will be then drawn back to the main fire. In areas like Warrenite where we've got, got the potential for the wind to swirl and come from all different directions, then our fire behavior is going to be more erratic and there won't be one direction that the embers come from. And it would be very, very easy to find ourselves surrounded by fire at some of our properties, particularly in those steep, narrow, winding roads with one way in and one way out. Uh, and really, I'd, I'd like to uh, just you to reflect on if you didn't have a plan, weren't engaged with the external environment on a high risk day and a fire started, what situation would you find yourself in? Would you be able to cope physically and emotionally? Would you be able to keep yourself and your loved ones safe? Would you be able to keep your pets safe? Because one of our most valuable people who live at our homes is generally our four-legged friends. So our planning needs to incorporate those pets as well. Now this next one is radiant heat. So embers is what burns our buildings down. Radiant heat is what is fatal to people. I, it was remiss of me prior to that last video. If you have experienced fire or find these sorts of things traumatic, please feel free to step away from your screens for a few minutes while we run the, the video because we don't want anyone distressed. This is about trying to inform you and explain and illustrate the effects of embers and radiant heat and why we need to have adequate planning and decision making in place before the fire even starts. So we'll now run the radiant heat video. Victoria is one of the most bushfire-prone parts of the world. Every summer, bushfires threaten properties and lives. But did you know it's not the flames that kill most bushfire victims? No, it's the radiant heat. Most victims die from the effects of radiant heat long before they're reached by the flames. <coughs> radiant heat is what you feel when you sit next to a campfire. If a campfire heats up to two kilowatts per square meter, you'll feel that it's too hot and will want to move back from the fire. If you don't, this amount of radiant heat is enough to cause burns and blisters in as little as 40 seconds. At 12 kilowatts, it can cause some materials like dry timber to ignite. A bushfire can reach 100 kilowatts and the effects can be truly catastrophic. For humans, radiant heat can cause burns from 100 meters away and cause a dangerous increase in body temperature. Radiant heat can cause the rapid onset of heat stroke. Heat stroke damages your brain, meaning you won't be able to concentrate to make good decisions as the fire arrives. Other impacts include severe damage of internal organs and death. There are some things you can do if you're caught in a fire. Cover your skin with long-sleeved natural fibre clothing, like wool. It's also useful to know that radiant heat only travels in straight lines and can't bend around corners. So, sheltering behind or inside solid structures may help protect you. But be aware, radiant heat will travel straight through glass. The best defence against radiant heat is a simple one. If you're not anywhere near a bushfire, its radiant heat can't hurt you. Leaving early is always your safest option. Right, so leaving early means leaving before the fire has started. 
Now, now this is just some example of radiant heat. So we can see how it's peeled and, and melted the, the paint and plastics on the house. It's adversely affected the road signage. Start at the singed bushes. So again, this is the heat generated. Now, uh, the video talked about 100 kilowatts of energy generated by the fire. The fires of Black Saturday in 19... 83, my apologies, Ash Wednesday in 1983 and Black Saturday in 09 exceeded 140,000 kilowatts per metre of fire front at times. So it is an enormous amount of energy being generated by the, by the fire, travels in straight lines and is fatal. And it can set other vegetation and buildings on fire. Now this is some quotes from uh, people at different fires. So 2018, 09. And one of the challenges with 2009 is that this February, it's 12 years ago. So for those of us who have got young people in their early 20s, they, they were around 12, 13 when this event happened. So their, their perceptions and their experiences may be very different to what they are now and their understanding may well have been diminished or not been fully affected. And we're all affected emotionally by the events, but we need to think about, I suppose, the, card, the hard, cold facts of the fire and make informed decisions about how we stay safe. Now, so this is a, a little video clip of some comments of people who were affected by fires. Most of the, all these people were there when the fire occurred. We're just waiting on that to come up. Here we are. Ten years ago, when all the dams were full and the tanks were full and there was plenty of water, I probably would have stayed and I would have died. Nothing went the way we might have anticipated. Whatever preparations you put into place, you only need something small to go wrong. You know, in, in future, I, I don't think we'd want to put the kids through that sort of trauma, I guess. Yeah wouldn't put the kids through that again. If it was my choice, I wouldn't stay again. If another, if we had another day like that, uh, if I had the opportunity to get out, I would go before the fire even got here. Right, so some fairly pertinent comments there from people who were at the 2009 fires, they stayed and they defended. They survived and looking back on it, the vast majority of those folk go, there is no way known I'm ever going through that experience again. They will leave and leave early based on the fire danger rating of their particular location. Now, what does this mean for all of us? So part of our planning and preparation and decision making is having a think about what are we doing on these high risk days? Now, when a fire starts in our area, it's going to be a stressful and traumatic situation. And if we don't have a plan or we really haven't thought about it, then we are not going to make fully informed decisions. The exit roads might be blocked. So if you've only got a, a dead end road that you need to go out and a tree has come down, brought the power lines down, maybe someone else has crashed a car and that road is blocked and you can't get out, now, what are your options? The ember attack. Uh, we've got another poll up. So if you'd like to answer some of those uh, questions about your perceptions. So again, what do you think would impact on your ability to make good decisions? So it's multiple choice. So fill out, fill out as many of those as you think. So the uh, ember attack will cause the fire to spread and spread quite rapidly. And then, of course, once we've got house A on fire, it's now generating more heat, more embers, more radiant heat, more toxicity, and can now start to burn the house next door down. So we get this house-to-house -house transfer. Radiant heat 
is the biggest killer of people in bushfires. All right, still got the votes coming in. We've got 42 of 52. Okay, so our results are, so we've got the 91%, or which is 40, 40 people, 91% is stress, 98% or 43 of you, rapidly changing situations, 39 said things not going to plan, and things won't go to plan. It's a rapidly dynamic escalating event, not having enough time, 86%, 38 of you. And if we think about back to 2014, on a day of extreme where that fire started in Warrandyte, there was no time because the fire started in town and impacted on that first house in five minutes. There's no time. Communication breakdown, 82%, 36 responses. We can almost guarantee the communications are, will be one of the first things that go down. Part of it is if you are relied on your 240 electricity to run your radio, run your computers, perhaps the mobile phone's not charged up quite as much as it should have been, the power goes off, it is now really difficult to get this information and the heat. Now we're talking about hot days. So we're already in our mid to high 30s into our mid to low 40s. We've got this hot, dry, gusting nor northwesterly wind. The air is really dry. So just the hot day impacts on our ability to, to start to think and make informed decisions. Now we throw a fire in with its heat, its smoke, its confusion, it starts to get overwhelming. And again, our ability to make good decisions will be impacted by many, many factors and, and many of which we just saw in that uh, poll, which you've picked up on. <clears throat> so the, the $25,000 question always is, how do I know if there is a fire? Now, there are some proactive ways and there are some reactive ways to perhaps stay informed. And our best way to be proactive is the fire danger rating now, what is the fire danger rating for Central District? On our CFA website, cfa.vic.gov.au, on our homepage, we have a map of the state showing you those nine total fire ban districts, and they are shaded up as to what the fire danger rating is in that area. Now, I recommend you check tonight for tomorrow, but check again tomorrow around 9, 9.30, because the weather forecast is updated. And those fire danger ratings can change from 5 p.m. today to 9 a.m. tomorrow. And the days that we are particularly concerned about is from severe on. Since this system came in, in post-2009, in Central District, we have not had a day of code red. So to base all our planning and our decision making on a day of code red, I will do this. Can I suggest we are overly optimistic and overly ambitious? However, every year, potentially in Central District, we will have maybe three or four days of severe and one or two days of extreme. And they're the days that we need to enact our fire plan. And if your plan is to leave the district and not be in Warrandyte, then based on that fire danger rating, that's when you pack up and go. Now, on a day of severe, if you leave by 10 o'clock on that high risk day, then that's fine. But the script is around fire on these days. A day of severe will be a hot, dry, potentially windy day. Should a fire start and establish itself in the, the landscape, there's another poll up there. So this is we'll interesting to find out what our perceptions of what the fire danger rating means for us. The, the fire, if it gets established, may be difficult to control. With a day of extreme, we are talking about an extremely hot day. So we will we'll now be potentially 40 degrees plus. We will have hot, dry, gusting, nor-nor-westerly winds. 
the, the amount of moisture in the air will be low, so it will be at 16% or less. And invariably, on a day of extreme, a weather change late in the afternoon with those winds from the northwest to the southwest is generally there. All right, so 13 people have said the fire danger rating is an indicator of how likely a fire will start, and 25 people have said that the fire danger rating is an indicator of how bad a fire would be if one were to start. So congratulations to the majority. The fire danger ratings are about expected and anticipated fire behavior. So the worst the fire behavior, then the more difficult that fire is to contain, control, and extinguish. And we need something to change in our favor. So what so a couple of the main things we need to do is be aware of our weather patterns in Warrandyte. So when a, a northwesterly wind is forecast, what does that do at your little bit of paradise? So depending on where you are in Warrandyte, you may or may not get a nor northwesterly wind. But when that southwesterly wind change comes through, what does that do for you? So we need you to go out and do some observations. So you, if you understand the weather, what the wind's doing, then you will have some idea what the fire may do, depending on where the fire starts. So we could start in Warrandyte. A lot of people expect it is going to start in North Warrandyte under a northwesterly wind and spot across the river that way. One of the biggest risks to all of our areas, and particularly is that southwesterly wind change. If there is a fire in South Warrandyte Park Orchards part of the world, under a southwesterly wind, that has the potential to bring that fire into the back door of Warrandyte. So we need to be aware of that. So that would then change our potential points of safety and the ways in which we may, may or may not be able to leave the township. So understanding that southwesterly wind change is vital. And in some of the fires we've spoken about, the Ash Wednesdays, the Black Saturdays, where we've had multiple property losses and multiple loss of life, it is after the wind change is when we get our killer fires. That is when the majority of the property is lost and that's when the lives are lost because the fire changes direction and we end up with a much bigger fire than what we started with and it is terrifying, so be aware. So, we, so in Warrandyte, on a day of severe, is really where you want to be. On extreme, I would not be in Warrandyte personally. It is a good day to leave, and there are already some businesses who have made a decision that they will close on days of extreme fire danger rating. The Code Red, as I said, we have not had one in Central District. There have been four or five in the state and they have been in the Wimmera, the Mallee, and the Northern Country. Northern Country is that bit up around Echuca. So we expect that to be hotter and drier because of its locations. But if you're going on holidays to those areas, be aware. Now, so how do I find out about it? So there's formal and informal ways of finding out. So having the radio on is a good way. So the commercial radio stations, it might be the local FM radio station, they will broadcast the information once they've got it from the authorities. But the authorities have only got it once the fire has started. Uh, the, you might be down the shops and hear some people talking, oh, fire started. Someone might ring you up. There is, a, a, the local fire brigade has a Facebook page. So it's good to, to like that and get that local information off the brigade. So knowing, uh, so what we can do, local news. Now, if you're just watching the Channel 7, Channel 9 or any of those, then all that program is mainly remote. So you won't get that program interrupted to get the local news. There's the Vic Emergency Hotline, which is a, a phone line you can ring, 1800 226 226. So you can ring up the hotline and find out what the fire danger rating is. Is there any fires in and around the area at a given time? There's online. 
Emergency Management Victoria. So the website emergency.vic.gov.au. Social media. The Vic Emergency app. So I would recommend that you all have that Vic Emergency app downloaded on your mobile phones with an appropriate search zone. Now, you just need to manage that a little bit. If you have it too wide, then it's got the opportunity just to drive you silly because it'll keep pinging. But again, it you won't get a message on that app until an event has happened and it has been reported to the fire services. There's national relay services for people with hearing impairment, there's interpreter services, and there are emergency alerts. Now, again, these alert messages about whether it's a watch and act emergency alert, they go out once the fire has started and the level of alert that goes out will depend on the situation based on the weather, which underpins the relevant fire danger rating. So the fire danger rating is our best and simplest way of knowing what our level of preparedness needs to be for that particular day. Now, our day of fire danger rating, so severe and upwards will be supported by a day of total fire ban and it runs from midnight to midnight. So if you have left the area, then you need to have a sleepover. So it's about where can you go, what do you need to take and make sure that you, you've got somewhere to sleep. Because to me, just going up to the pictures or going up the shopping center or at, at the Pines or somewhere, it just doesn't cut it for me. Because when I get to six o'clock and I get thrown out, now what do I do? And six o'clock is a, or seven o'clock, it's still a hot, windy part of the day and fires can start later in the day and you've gone home at the worst possible time. So it's about where are you going to stay? You might need to have a bit of a slush fund so that you can go and stay at a hotel or a motel that night. We are talking potentially two or three days most years. If it's an extremely hot year, then it will be a few more. Now, we'll go and have a look. Now, so the first message that goes out is an advice. Now, this is frequently issued. And you'll be able to get this off the emergency website. And this is telling you something has happened. So this is not only around bushfires. This is around building fires. It's around tip fires and anything else giving off toxic smoke. And generally the advice is stay inside, shut the door, shut the windows, and don't come down and have a sticky beak. A watch and act is a heightened level of activity. Now, this is generally around our bushfires and our grass fires. So we need to keep an eye on what's going on and we need to take some action. And that action may well be to activate your bushfire plan. And an emergency warning. This is an imminent threat to life and property that the fire will impact on you within two hours. So our friends who had their house on fire within five minutes of the fire starting in 2014, no warnings had gone out at that point because it was too early in the situation. We need to get some eyeballs on it. So we need our first fire truck to get there and we need to get some information back so that our warning people can get this out. Now an emergency warning, this will come up on your mobile phone, it will come up on your house phone if you've got one, it will come up on your websites. And it will invariably say, it is now too late to leave, you need to seek shelter, you need to activate your bushfire survival plan. So part of the deal is, I'm encouraging everyone to develop and write down what your plan is, and that planning involves everyone in the house. So you, if you've got teenagers, involve them. Okay, they go, oh yeah, right, oh, whatever, roll their eyes. But they need to know what the plan is. As a partnership, you both need to be on the same page about what you are doing and how you're getting organized. But please, don't wait for the warning. Evacuations, so the, in Victoria, you cannot be forced to leave your home. 
evacuation can be recommended. This will be invoked and managed by Victoria Police. However, I would suggest that a fire impacting on the Warrandyte area, there will not be an evacuation because there is not enough time. The fire will start, the impact will be almost immediate, and there is no time to run round and round up everyone and suggest that they leave. It will just create havoc. You need to be proactive. You need to understand the risk you live with. You are the best folk to understand the dynamics and the challenges in your household and leave and leave early before the fire has started on those high risk days of severe and extreme. And we, and it's community information. Now, so part of it is the fire starts. However, that could be, I look, there's a million ways a fire can start. Someone needs to see that fire and dial triple zero and report the fire. So uh, somewhere after 15 minutes, an advice message is released. Now in 15 minutes on a day of extreme, this fire has escalated quite rapidly. Even on a day of severe, the fire will escalate quite rapidly. So you've got an advice message that says, oh, there's a, there's a fire in the area. You go, well, that's nice, dear. The, the fire may now have gone through or past your property in 30 minutes. And now we've updated it to an emergency warning. It's too late when your house is burnt down or your house is surrounded by fire for us to now wait for that warning and go, now I will do something. And then at, at 45 minutes, the, the fire is continuing to escalate and grow generating more heat, generating more embers, burning down more properties. We are responding more and more fire trucks into the Warrandyte district via those same roads that are now choked. If the trees have come down, the power lines are down, it is going to create problems for our people to get in. There may be aircraft operating. So periodically, on a hot day, please go outside on a regular basis and use your senses. What can you see? What can you hear? What can you smell? So if you see or hear something, okay, so it might be aircraft operating, helicopters operating in the, the local area. You may see the smoke. You might smell the smoke. You might see convoys of fire trucks under lights and sirens maneuvering in the area. You need to find out more information, make informed decisions about what you are going to do and activate your written fire survival plan. I oh, know, in the planning and decision making. So we'll paint a little scenario here. So it's a day of extreme fire danger rating at 7.30 in the morning and you're heading off to work. And as we head out to the car, it's already hot, it's sticky, the wind is gusting and blustering. You have a look around and you go, Gee, I, I only swept this place up yesterday and raked it up. Now I've got all these leaves and twigs back. You jump in your car and start to head into the office, thinking about that meeting you've got. You've got some deadlines to go. Uh, as you drive out of Warrandyte, the winds are buffeting your car. So you crank the air conditioner up a little bit more. You're tuned into your local favourite radio station. And they're talking about how hot and dry it is in Central District. And today is a day of extreme fire danger rating and a day of total fire ban. People start to ring in and are talking about oh, how windy it is at, the, at their place, in their location. They're talking about branches coming down, twigs coming down out of the trees. And you're noticing that as you're driving out of Warrandyte, that some of the, the twigs, some of the smaller branches are starting to come down and you press on. You get to work, get inside, and around about lunchtime, in the lunchroom, you overhear a couple of your work colleagues commenting, oh, there's a, there's a fire started out in the Warrandyte area. And you start to get a little bit worried. You think, you know what, I'm going to head for home. 
So you leave the office, jump in the car, and start to drive back to Warrandyte. But you, but you only get three or four k's from where you really want to uh, be, and you run into a traffic management point established by Victoria Police, and they now inform you that the roads are closed and it is not safe to enter Warrandyte due to uh, fire activity, responding emergency vehicles, the number of trees and branches that are coming down in the area, and there are a number of power lines down. And they advise you to go and find somewhere to go and sit until it is safe to go in. Now, how are your stress levels going at the moment? So you've tried to get back. You think, oh, I've left the teenagers at home. I've got the dog at home. I need to get back and get them. I don't know where my partner is. All right, so another poll up. So on an average Wednesday, not all bushfires and grass fires will start on a weekend. They can start any day of the week at any time. So we need to think about over that uh, period from Christmas to the end of February, where will you be? What will you be doing? What will your family members be doing? So if you've got teenagers that have just finished year 12, or, or year 11, are you going to leave them at home by themselves? If it is a day of high fire risk in Warrandyte, are you going to leave these young people at home by themselves on a day of extreme fire danger rating, knowing that they haven't got any transport? The public transport in Warrandyte is not all that well or good. And the buses won't run on a high fire risk day if there is fire in the area. They will be. And our young people generally are not engaged in fire safety. Right, is anyone else to vote? We've got 41 of 50. Up to 42. All right, so what we've got is we've got 19 people will be at work, 22 people will be at home, one lucky person's on holiday. Gee, I hope they take me. And thinking about last summer, would we have been prepared if you need to spend a few nights away from home in an emergency situation? So 22 of us were, 12 of us weren't, and eight of us really don't know. Okay, there was a, a question just popped up then. Now, so what we're really looking at here is that period of school holidays, when you've got your treasures at home over the school holidays, what are you going to do with them? You've got to go to work, and in some occupations, you can't take the children to work with you. If you've got teenagers, then it's probably not cool to go to work with mum and dad anyway, and they don't want to be there. So we need to think about all of these types of dynamics. All right, so same day, day of extreme, the fire started. The fire is still some distance from your property and you actually get home. So you're a bit ahead of the, the traffic management point that so you've got home and you now want to start to collect some things, thinking we've got time. But as we start to rattle around the house with this list in our head, what do I need to grab? Oh, there's some photos. I need some financial records. I need it. We need our passports. I need to grab the spare medication out of the, out of the cabinet. I need to try and catch the dog or the cat and try and get them into a lead in the car. Now, all this is taking longer than we thought it was. We're running backwards and forwards of the car, loading things in. <clears throat> it's about trying to now unhook the computer because you need to take the hard drive with you. Have we got all the laptops in the house? 
you might go, oh, I need to run around and get some photos of my furniture and, and some of the paintings I've got on the wall or some other antiques. So that's going to take time. And as we're doing this, you notice that the place around your place is now getting smokier and smokier and now the embers start to land. With that sudden realization, I'm out of time. It has just gone pear-shaped. What am I now going to do to ensure I survive? Because what we've done, we've left the office. Now, wherever that was, you know, and we'll suggest that that's in a fairly safe location. So you've now left a really safe location to go back to the most dangerous place you can think about, and you're now trapped. What are your options? And it happens. Now what, so what is one thing you could have done differently? So we got a poll for that, Taryn. No, no poll for this on Evan. Just, okay. um, just to let people know, just have a think about what they could do differently in this scenario if you do get stuck at home or. Um, with the hypothetical, what would their options be in that scenario and how could they how could they avoid that from happening? Okay, yep. So well, I'll just get you to reflect on it and have a think about it. So what could you have done differently? What would have made a difference to you leaving a safe location and putting yourself into a higher risk location? And you've already picked up a number of those risks of the narrow winding, one-way way roads, poor access, egress, all those types of things. Right, so making a plan, being prepared. So knowing what you will do. So think ahead. We need to make the plan before summer starts. And so we need to have a roundtable discussion and we need to write the plan down. It needs to be fairly simple. So, and it starts out, what is your trigger point? So on what fire danger rating will you enact your plan? Where will you go as your safe location? How will you get there? So are we able to drive there? Can I catch the bus? What do I need to take? So we recommend you have a go kit. And some of the things that need to go in that go kit is a change of clothes for a couple of days, some identification, so driver's licenses, passports, financial records, credit card records, investment records, medication, copies of repeat scripts in there, some drinking water. If you've got pets with you, you'll need water, food, and a bowl for the pets, some snacks for you. You'll need some protective clothing because one of the key things we need to do in any fire is to cover up as much bare skin as possible with a natural fiber. So long sleeve shirt, long pants, solid shoes, Leather gloves, the sort of gloves you'd wear pruning the rose bushes, and we need a set of that for everyone in the house. Some of the additional things that you now need to think about putting into that go kit is some hand sanitizer, some additional face masks because we're still in a COVID environment, <clears throat> and where you go may be a little bit more crowded than you would be comfortable with. Make sure that we've got our mobile phones fully charged. If you've got power banks, they're fully charged. If our plan fails, we're there with the survival options and that we are now starting to roll the dice. Right, so cover up. That's the, that's the first thing, as I said. Uh, cover your head, cover your face, cover your eyes, natural fibers, leather gloves, sturdy boots, and wool or cotton socks. It's all about natural fibers, not manufactured fibers because you're sweating those and, and they're most uncomfortable. Right, we might be able to shelter inside or behind a solid object. However, if the building you are sheltering in catches fire, then you need to work your way through that building 
closing as many doors behind you as you can and then out the exit and find shelter in a, a clear area. Now this is going to be a terrifying event because the fire is external. The fire has now set fire to your, your safe zone and you have to get out. If you stay in that house, it is unsurvivable. All of these options that we're now looking at is options of last resort. It is desperation. In any fire, the worst possible place to be is out in the open. The second worst place to be is trapped in your car. A ploughed paddock or reserve or slash grass may give you some options. The local swimming pool. Okay, depending on how far away from your house that is, you've got, and, re, and bear in mind any of these things you've got to commit from your house to that locality. And that may be extremely difficult with the fire, the smoke, emergency vehicles, trees, power lines down, all sorts of hazards happening. Getting in a dam, desperate stuff. The river in Warrandyte, there is no way known I would go anywhere near that river because you've got continuous threads of uh, fuel on either side. So those that vegetation along the river will carry the fire through Warrandyte and it would be a bit like being in your Weber. So you've got fire on both sides, you're stuck in the river, it's not very deep, it's cold if you cramp and what else is in the river with you? So I used to worry about the snakes being in there once, but if a, a couple of kangaroos get in there and they decide they want to play let's drown the resident, it's not going to be a lot of fun. So it is desperate stuff. Being in your car in Warrandyte, being in your car stuck on the side of the road is basically unsurvivable. Do not be there. So leaving early is really the only option you've got. A neighborhood safer places, place of last resort, now these are continually reviewed. The, the uh, Senior Citizens Club uh, was the place of last resort, but again, check your municipal website because they are reviewed annually and can change depending on vegetation and other considerations. But quite often, these places of the last resort are something like an open area such as a football oval or a reserve. Uh, there's one here, it's in the middle of town. Now, we've got a place, a large resort here in Eltham. It's a bitumen road that runs behind the shopping centre. So it's going to be really exciting. So in these reserves, don't expect any emergency services or other support services to turn up. There is no provision for services for young children, the, the frail, the aged, the infirm. There is no provision for pets. There is potentially nowhere to get a drink of water. There is nowhere to go to the toilet. It just sounds absolutely dapper, doesn't it? So these are neighbourhood safer places. They are places of absolute last resort when every other plan has failed, but they do not guarantee your survival. You could still be injured, could still be traumatised, attempting to get to one of these places or being there. So don't plan. Now, so the following content is, may be distressing. This is some photos of fire damage. So again, if you have had uh, unfortunate experiences with fire, please walk away and, uh, and don't be put yourself in a, a position where it's distressing. And we could certainly expect some of this to happen in and around the Warrandyte area. So cars have crashed. So one car has up, ended up on the wrong side of the road, crashed and then the cars are subsequently burnt out. Heavily vegetation. We've got uh, smoke, trying to, the photo down the bottom, second from the right. Again, trying to drive into the, or through that smoke is potentially a fatal decision. We will have trees down, we'll have branches down, we'll have power lines down, we might have signage down, blocking roads. The visibility of smoke, you can't see more than about six inches, eight inches in front of your face in the old language. 
So the visibility is poor. It's easy to become disorientated, particularly on narrow winding roads. And if those roads have deep culverts and you end up in one of those, then we are immobilized. Try to drive through fire is absolutely terrifying. The traumatic scenes that you will see of, or potentially of buildings burning down, you may have injured people, you may have cars on fire. It will be highly distressing and stressful. So not being there, making that decision to leave and leave early based on the fire danger rating before the fire started is absolutely vital. The plan needs to be reviewed annually because your personal circumstances and the circumstances of your family will change on an annualized basis. Now, and we all like to live in the past and we all have someone who lives in our head that says, I'm only 25 and I can do this, but our body tells us something different. Now, as I said earlier, Black Saturday is almost 12 years ago. So what we could do 12 years ago, we may not be able to do today. What we could do back in 1983 on Ash Wednesday, for those of you who were around, we potentially can't do today. So it is about having that plan in place, discussing your options with friends, colleagues, random people you may know. Now, there are some resources you can download. So download the resources. So your guide to survival, your guide to property preparation. Write a plan and prepare your property. So we've got bushfire planning workshops to help you and, and Tara will be hopefully scheduling some of those. But please make sure you've downloaded the Vic Emergency app that will give you some information. You might be able to connect with your local fire brigade and community. So generally the local brigade have got members down there on a Sunday morning and they're quite happy to have a bit of a chat, give you some advice and perhaps uh, give you some information about uh, the, the area you're in, uh, what we would expect the fire to do, particularly our newer residents who haven't been out in Warrandyte when things have gone horribly wrong. Those beautiful sunny days on a Sunday when Warrandyte is full of tourists and the locals stay well away from Yarra Street, is if something goes wrong, it is just going to be chaos central because they won't know what to do and they will take off and, and do all sorts of silly things. You've got that magnificent market in Stiggins Reserve that you have is it once a month. And again, if that's on a high risk day and something goes wrong, it is not going to end well. So it's about picking your mark, picking your targets and leaving and leaving early before the fire has started to keep you and your loved ones safe. Because with two and a bit fire trucks in Warrandyte, there is just absolutely no way known we are going to get to every house we will not have a fire truck in every street and our resources will be about trying to contain and extinguish that fire but the conditions are quite often beyond us there'll be if it is safe to do so there'll be aircraft deployed to help fight the fire and they will dump uh, water or other fire retardants and that will come down through the tree. So if you see aircraft operating, then keep well clear because the last thing you want is to have any of that uh, suppression agent dropped anywhere near you. And you certainly don't want to be near trees where this agent is dropped because the weight of it just may bring branches and trees crashing down. So contacting our local district office. Uh, so again, our District 13 office in uh, Churchside Park. The phone number is there with an email of d 13 comment at cfa.vic.gov.au. So and in an emergency where you require emergency response for life-threatening events, triple zero or 112 from a mobile phone will work. So our last uh, poll. So we're we've got forty two responses in out of four, uh, up to forty three. So it's looking fairly good. All 
Right, so what we've got is, uh, did this meeting give you a better understanding of bushfire risk in your local area? I've got 35 yes. I've disappointed one person and didn't meet their expectations. My apologies. Seven people confirmed what they already knew. And would you recommend this program to family, friends or neighbours? 42 said yes. And again, I've disappointed one person with a no. Now support is available. So if going through the session or seeing any of those videos uh, tonight has in any way upset anyone, uh, then it's about having a talk to, to someone about how you're feeling or perhaps contacting Beyond the Blue or Lifeline. But please don't sit there and just uh, let it eat away at you. Uh, it can be quite distressing. There are life issues involved in fire. And, and it is a challenge. But look, you live in a beautiful location, but it is a high risk bushfire area on those number of days over summer. Now, other than the fire in 2014, it has been a long time since serious fire uh, visited uh, us out here in Eltham, Warrandyte, etc. And uh, we hope it stays that way, but we do need to be prepared for an event that may well happen at some time in the future. If there's any last questions, uh, please feel free to throw them into the chat and we'll get your response uh, back as soon as we can. Right, so if there's nothing else, okay, I'd like to take the opportunity on behalf of Taryn and myself at CFA District 13 to thank you all for taking the time tonight to tune in and your questions have popped up through chat. So please enjoy a very, very safe and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year and a fire-free, safe summer, whether you're at home in Warrandyte or one, or one of the other magnificent holiday spots we've got in Victoria, many of which are high risk.